A weekend of drama for the Phoenix Suns highlighted what we already knew about this team, which is that they have gone from the hunters to the hunted. They have gone from controlling every minute of every game to getting embarrassed, frankly. Aaron Edwards joins today's show to talk through a dramatic, chaotic weekend in New Orleans and what this losing streak tells us about how the Suns are viewed around the NBA. Let's go. You are locked on Suns. Your daily Phoenix Suns podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are back. This is Locked On Phoenix Suns. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, and I'm your host, Brendan Clean, a credential media member covering the Suns for the past six seasons and a writer at Suns.com and Dime Magazine. Thank you all for making Locked On Suns your first listen here on this Tuesday. Another Suns game day, another opportunity to end this losing streak, but we have one more day to talk about it. So if you're finding us for the first time, hit subscribe or follow, get the post game show tonight, get shows throughout the week, throughout every week. Here on Locked On Suns, we're on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you find the show. If you are on YouTube, drop a comment down below with your thoughts on this losing streak. I want to hear from all of you as well. Don't want to just have it be my thoughts, of course. Today's show, guys, brought to you by Prize Picks. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code LOCKED ON. That's prizepicks.com, promo code LOCKED ON. Aaron, I think it's a good uh, it's a good show for you to be on because, I, as I was telling you before, um, the the drama is getting to me, and it also is a good time for you to be on because I think this is a week you used to write for All Caps NBA with Jason Concepcion and, and the great team that that put that show together, and you would have had to completely just laugh at and and joke on it would have been an embarrassing week for you on that show i'm sure because the suns would have been the subject of every single sketch i feel like not just because of the losing but because of what i wanted to talk about a little bit more today which i didn't get into on the show which is just the uh the way they're seen in the league let's let's put it that way um you and i've been texting about this a little bit but we'll start with the pelicans the Zion 360 dunk at the end, and then the Alvarado Chris Paul drama that is apparently never going to go away. We're at almost a full year of it at this point. What did you make of the way that things got a little chippy? There was almost like a fight at the end of the first game, and then guys getting fouled out in the second game, the dunk capitalizing all of it. What did you make of, of the shenanigans in New Orleans this weekend? Um, it was. I think that the team kind of needed it, but like, I really, there was no way this was going to go other than that. Alvarado, you can tell was getting to Chris Paul, even in the playoffs, like everybody knew he was getting to him. He got him with the hiding behind the bench thing. He pressed him. I think he gave him an eight second violation and he kind of like showed some of Chris Paul's flaws in game six. uh, Chris Paul went off a little bit and he finally got him, but Alvarado kind of showed the playbook on what to do to Chris Paul during the playoffs because the Mavs did exactly that the next series. So, um, yeah, this was always going to be chippy. I'm shocked Chris Paul came back for this one <laughs> and like, or like didn't give it a week, especially during a stretch like this. But yeah, it seems like everybody kind of just knows the playbook and it was always going to be testy. Willie Green knows this team. He like knows our flaws and he knows how to like get to us, even without Brennan Ingram. And yeah, and with Zion there, it was just – Zion was always going to get his. I mean, I like that he does put his shoulder down and does some stuff that I like some of our players to do, even though they're not as big as them. But, yeah, it's just like they're coming together. They're pretty much us two years ago, but people like them more. They didn't like how we did it. <laughs> so, it oh, seems people are like, not going to – look, if, if the Pelicans play somebody that's not the Suns in the first round – um. Alvarado's junk and and this is not me saying that I I dislike it uh people like to point out the Bucks thing on my wall but <laughs> I I'll put out I'll, I'll I'll move my head and you can see that's Zion so I don't uh I don't dislike this team myself but if it's not the Suns it's not going to be quite as cute um I loved you mentioned Willie Green I loved uh 
Kevin Young and Willie Green almost getting into it, it looked like. that. Yeah. That's a fight that I would have wanted probably more than any of them because players, uh, you know, they, they can do whatever little BS on the court, and Chris Paul did plenty of it. Um, but if coaches were getting to that level, I feel like, I don't know. They're, they're more, they're less predictable to me. Players are just going to do the Jordan Clarkson of putting their fists up and then getting, uh, getting escorted away from the the scene. But, uh, it feels like Kevin Young and Willie Green, if there, there was anything, I, I, I would have felt like they were going to have the craziest fight, but what did you mean? Uh, or what did you make of the Zion part of it? It's not so much how he played. I agree. They had no answer for him. He was insane. He scored 70 combined points. He was like putting up field goal percentages that I feel like, I didn't know guys could do on high usage anymore, and it, it didn't even look hard. Uh, but the dunk thing, like he he kind of took ownership of it and, and apologized more than I expected him to because he's like the most polite dude on the planet, it yeah. seems like. But did you have a problem with it? I don't feel like you – you don't seem to me like the type who's going to cry no. about uh, some end-of-game shenanigans. No, and surprisingly, Aiton was the only person on our team that had the clear, like, view on it. He was like – Zion missed a year. He's in front of his home crowd. Like, the kids want to see him do cool stuff. Yes, he's going to do that. They're going to remember that for the rest of their life, that Zion did a 360 windmill to end a game against the Suns. I'm sorry. That's what the NBA wants. That's what the people pay for. Like, that's what sells the tickets. So, yeah, like, I get, like, rules of the game. But basketball isn't that. Like, you go to any pickup game, the goal is to embarrass a stranger. Like, it's that. it's been that since the beginning of basketball. It's embarrassed the dude in front of you. Like, yes, you want baseball games to end and you want people to stop hitting at some point, but basketball is always embarrassed the dude. <laughs> and it will always be that. And I feel like, yes, the Suns were on the wrong end of it, but basketball till the day it's over, till the day this earth is gone, <laughs> will be about embarrassing the other team. That's just always what it's going to be. <laughs> well, and Zion, like the way he put it, wasn't that far from what Aiden said. Is He's like, I had to sit there not being able to help this team while we got, you know, eliminated by them like yeah I had some feelings about things and also like if anyone could do a 360 dunk like that uh, <laughs> at the end of a game I'm sure everybody would I don't know if there's a single player on the Suns who could do a dunk like that so I don't know if they even have space to talk me and you can't do uh, dunks like that so I yeah. think it's probably smart of us to be on the other side of this thing the guy's the guy's huge he knows what uh, is is impressive about his game he knows what's going to put a, an exclamation mark on the win and he went out and did it. I thought CJ McCollum's comments were actually the funniest, which where he was like, play better defense, get back in transition, you know? <laughs> like, stop it, <laughs> which, which I get. But the thing that I think took things to a little bit of another level were uh, the campaign comment that went a little bit viral about sportsmanship and everything else. Then people go online and they start tweeting out, hey, the Suns did this exact thing, not only against the Pelicans themselves in an out-of-reach game in the playoffs last year, but also the Mavericks. And then, you know, we all know how that series ended. So you can't have it both ways. And I think the same thing can be said about Chris Paul and Jose Alvarado, which is that Chris Paul seems to continue to think that we all don't have cameras on him during these games. And, like, I'm not – I don't feel like I've ever gone crazy defending Chris Paul – We've, I think, talked about it plenty of times, and it's one of those things where when you get to watch it every night, when it's a team you have a vested interest in, it's a little more fun. When you're on the other side of it, a little less fun. But the part that I don't seem to understand about this is him continuing to think that he's going to get the benefit of the doubt when we all know what he is doing to Jose Alvarado and tons of rookies. I think you could throw the the foul he got fouled out on with Zion into this same camp where it's like he he's playing these tricks on these kids so to speak these younger players but we all the jig is up we get what he's doing now and he still wants us to be on his side of this and it's like if you're gonna do it then just do it but don't be surprised when like you get a foul when when the guy fights back when it turns into something at the end of these games I don't know I, I that part of it I, I don't fully understand and it's like a level of denial that I can't say I was expecting about this Suns team that does talk so much yeah, it's wild because, like, Chris Paul, like, even before he got to the Suns, like, we all knew what he was, and we knew what we were signing up for. Like, I don't think to this extent we knew the hate was going to be this bad, <laughs> but I was on the hate side when he was on Houston. Like, I get it. <laughs> so, like, I don't know what he expected. Like, he got close to winning a finals with this team, and that's the one thing people hang on to. 
So as long as it's Chris Paul not winning a championship, people are going to hate him a lot. And then you add the Chris Paul. I think I said it on Twitter today, like the Chris Paul hate tax. Like the Suns were like probably wouldn't be this hated if we didn't have Chris Paul. But you add the Chris Paul hate tax to it (laughs) and it's just going to add more to it. So like him doing all the Chris Paul stuff and then us being bad kind of makes us look worse. But it's like we were winning and he was still doing the Chris Paul stuff. We'd be like, yeah, it's Chris being Chris, but we signed up for this. Now that we're not winning and he's still doing this stuff, it's like we signed up for this. Now people hate us and we're not even winning right now. Like, what is the point then? And so, yeah, like, I think that's the confusing part when it comes to Chris is like, what do you expect? People have hated you since you were at Wake Forest and now you're not even winning. So it's probably going to be even double that. Not winning and also, you know, a game where he finishes three of 10 from the field and fouls out, it's it's going to continue to to be that way. I think that's a fantastic transition because we wanted to talk about uh, the, the bigger picture because it, it was not just these two New Orleans games and it wasn't even just this losing streak. I think it's been pretty clear to anybody who's watched this team that uh, – Pretty much since the Dallas series, I would probably say the 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 fear factor around these Suns, it's it's fading, and I think that does play a part in why teams are are coming and facing this Suns team and, and having so much success. So let's dive into the the mystique fading. I don't know what we should call it, but let's dive into it next. First today's show, guys, brought to you by Prize Picks. Uh, you know the deal. Prize Picks came in. They looked at how people love sports. They looked at how people love to play with sports and they reinvented the whole entire script. Prize picks is simple. It's easy. It includes all sports. And I love it because it's not like most daily fantasy games. You're not setting your lineup against a huge pool. You're not setting your lineup against uh, a bunch of people that do it for a living or uh, a league where you have to continue to update it even after the league is basically over and, and you're not going to win it anymore. Prize picks allows you to pick two to six players. You pick more or less than their prize picks player projection. And you can win up to 25 your money, times your money on any entry. They have big time, you know, men's leagues, NBA, NFL, MLB. They also have WNBA, women's college basketball, even esports, NASCAR, tennis, anything you love, you can put into your lineup. And then you just pick is the player. Is the athlete going to get more or less than the projection? It could be points, rebounds in the NBA. It could be something uh, like wins in tennis or tournament wins, something like that. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less, and it's safe and fast withdrawal. So download the PricePix app now. Go to PricePix.com to sign up to play daily fantasy sports. First-time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code Locked On. means if you deposit $100, PricePix puts $100 right back in your pocket to keep going. Don't forget to enter the promo code locked on and sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100. Okay, Aaron. So uh, I think we had actually talked about this even before the second Pelicans game. It had been <laughs> on my mind to, to do as our show this week before even the first Pelicans game. Um, I think it was really the Celtics game that put it into perspective because the Mavs lost like Yeah, Dallas, like, I don't know if they were ever afraid of the Suns, as we saw in the playoffs, right? But the Celtics, I mean, they're they're a confident, cocky team right now, and they deserve to be. I don't even mean that as disrespectful. Like, they're the best team in the NBA. I don't know if it's close. Then you have the Pelicans games where things get chippy again, and it just starts to be adding up to a point where I just feel like, I don't know if I would say teams were, like, cowering in their boots every time they played the Suns last year, but you can sense a very clear change of, yes, you won 64 games. Yes, you were in the finals the year before, but you're not scaring us and we're not going to come up against you feeling like we're losing. We're going to play you like we're going to win. And four times in a row now, they that opponent has won. Yeah, I think like the league is pretty much playing us like, like, if you're playing, like, a inferior team and you know pretty much all of them can't use their offhand or their left hand, like, the league is playing us like that. It's just, like, they know we don't have another gear to go to. They know we can't use our other hand because we don't have it. <laughs> so they're playing us accordingly. It's, like, we're honestly really predictable right now. So I think that's probably where, like, a lot of the fear has left from. Like, we don't really have a fastball. Like, I know I'm mixing up a lot of sports, but – it's just 
we're one, we're like a running uh, team in the NFL. <laughs> And if you get ahead of a running team in the NFL and they have to use the quarterback they don't like that much, then, yeah, it's going to be tough to come back from that. And once you, like, snowball and we get down 15, 16, I kind of, like, have no hope after that because I know what we have. Everybody else knows what we have. And it's, like, not changing until it changes. So I think that's how teams are playing us. They're like, we get up 15, they're going to break because they don't have another thing after this. And they're playing us accordingly. So I wouldn't be scared of that either. Is there anything they can do? Like, I mean, we've talked about trades a million times. We know that's coming. I want to, I, maybe it does still need to be said because I've started to see people who are ignoring the presence of the Jay Crowder thing as, as if it's not going to come together. They're going to make that trade. But aside from improving the roster, is there something they can be doing in the course of these games that would allow them to at least demand the respect of the opponent? Because right now they're not getting that at all. I sent the text to you, what, yesterday that Book hasn't had another 21-point game score since he was 19 years old? You can't be scared of a team that is going through that. I'm sorry. If another team doesn't have a bucket, and like Bill Russell said, this game will forever be about getting buckets, (laughs) then no. like I don't know unless we can figure that part out is if your buckets are only coming from one person and you know at the end of the day you can just trap them and force somebody else that has not done it consistently, 21 points a game. We haven't had one on our team since Eric Bledsoe. If you know the other – if you know the other buckets aren't coming from anybody and Chris Paul hasn't shown us that he's willing to shoot enough to give you maybe like once a 30 or 27 piece once every, what, 10 games maybe, seven games, he hasn't showed us that he's willing to go to that bag anymore, then I don't know where you can like find fear from for some of these dudes. Yeah, I was pretty uh, impressed or like it made me a little more optimistic to see him A, be willing to take nine threes in the first of these games and B, make six of them. Like that that was a pretty impressive game for his second one back. It didn't look quite as good on, on Sunday. I mean, the, the reality might just be that he's going to be up and down and you just have to hope he can string them together in the playoffs, which, you know, conversation for a different time. <laughs> I would say you're being a little bit more like X's and O's about it than I'm being, honestly, because you just said it in that last segment about Zion. A lot of these these battles and the way the Suns have gotten in these holes of big deficits that they're having to fight back from it goes deeper than not having an offense because we saw, and you know, the the opponent might let off the gas a little bit when the game does get a, a big lead for them, but we've seen them be able to score. There was a, a chunk in that third quarter after Zion and, and they start getting in fast break mode that campaign comes in the game and, and turns the tide a little bit and, and they get back going and they actually outscored the Pelicans in that third quarter or got, got pretty close. I think it was 41-35. Like, there's these moments where they've still been able to score even without Booker playing well or without Booker even in the lineup, and they're still being played against as if none of that matters. And maybe it is just we don't have an offense, but I kind of don't feel like if I'm uh, if I'm Jose Alvarado and I'm putting myself in that mindset, I don't think he's being so uh, game plan oriented about it. <laughs> I feel like he's looking at this team and saying, like, you guys just don't have it. You don't have what it's going to take If I am on you, if I'm hounding you, if I'm getting chippy and forcing the ref to call fouls and I'm, you know, disrespecting you in that way, you're not going to have some, an answer for that. And that's not like you don't get to generate the right number of threes or blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, I just don't think you have it. And that's pretty deep. And I I don't know. I don't necessarily know what they do to, to come back against that. Cause I do think we've seen for three years now, Jose Alvarado, if he thinks that, I mean, he low-key might be right, especially without Jay Crowder. <laughs> yeah, I think even, like, our bully wasn't much of a bully. Like, it was – like, we haven't really had, like, a bullyish dude that's willing to, like, mix it up in, like, a long time. Jay Crowder wasn't even that. I think when we played uh, uh, the Warriors once and him and Draymond got into it, and Draymond was like, you're from the suburbs, so not you. <laughs> and I think, like, we just haven't really had, like, one of those people in – People know that. Like, you can, like, see when some dude just doesn't have it when you're playing a team. And I think the fact that we don't have one other than, like, our star player who's willing to mix it up sometimes. Like, Aiton really doesn't. Like, he kind of stays in his own zone. Like, I 
I don't know. Like for a player like my, or for a coach like Monty, who was like, who knows how important that is. He played with Bruce Bowen, I think. So I he was think, on like, the nineties Knicks. Yeah. So yeah. I think for a dude like Monty, who like got coached by Pat Riley, like I think he should know better than anybody else how important that is to a team like that. And yeah, we don't have a single one. And yeah, I just think it's wild that a dude like Monty and James Jones is in the league a long time. Like they know how important that is. And like we just don't have one. I think the closest thing is probably campaign, but <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like the thing with him, even if you take that seriously, which it sounds like you don't, is uh, <clears throat> he's so focused on not making mistakes out yeah. there, you know? So it's like, I think there's a version of campaign where he's like 20% more consistent and, and, and more reliable as like a, a player on the court where he could let that stuff be a little bit looser. Um, I mean, when he's on Twitter or when he's uh, talking to media, he can he can sometimes seem that way. But it's like he's he's like two mistakes away from getting benched at all moments. So it's like, what is he yeah. supposed to do? He can't afford that, you know, whereas Alvarado comes in. He had three fouls in his first stint in the game and he walked around, away from the court when he checked out like job well done. He had the worst yeah. score in the game and you feel like he made an impact because that's his job. The Suns don't have guys like that. Uh, I also don't appreciate your shot at the suburbs. I feel like that was in there a little <laughs> no, bit. No, I'm saying Brock I'm Purdy saying is representing the suburbs for the world. <laughs> he went to my high school and he did not seem to be getting uh, too much. He didn't seem to be suffering too much as a result of uh, his his presence in the suburbs. I didn't appreciate that. <laughs> I'm just saying that's what I'm just saying. Draymond meant it negatively. Like okay. I'm fine with where people grew up, but. Draymond, he meant it as a negative. <laughs> That's fair. It's it's safe to assume Draymond means most things in the most insulting way that that they can come out there. Um, all right, let's keep going with this. I want to talk about it as it pertains to going forward because again, I think this is opening up some some wounds that I don't know if they're solved by one trade. I want to bounce a theory off of you that I that I put out there last week, Aaron. But first, today's show is brought to you by Bet Online, uh, the number one source for you for all of your sports betting needs all year long, whether that's info, stats, news, or analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there. Uh, they have NBA MVP odds, NBA championship odds. Maybe you go in, you, you get in while the suns are low. I don't know, um, but... <laughs> Whether it's that or it's football, the rest of the regular season, maybe it's college football, playoff, whatever you love, they have odds for you. They also have news analysis, podcasts even, to get you informed. The fastest and easiest way to get your betting fixed. So head to the website today, that's betonline.net, or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online where the game starts. Today's show also brought to you by My Solar Nerd. If you live in Arizona, you know how often people are coming up to you on the street, at your house, whatever, telling you that they have what they call is free solar, but really we know it's not. My Solar Nerd, on the other hand, their mission is simple. Help you get the best solar system to fit your needs. And the guys at MySolarNerd.com are local, meaning they understand the nuances of doing solar in Arizona. They believe that a happy customer is one who is educated, an educated customer. And their no-pressure approach make sure all your questions get answered. Once you're ready, they'll put their industry knowledge to work for you by choosing the best equipment, warranties, and installers in their network. They also help you figure out all the credits and incentives you may qualify for on the back end to make sure the process, the transition is as smooth as possible. Our listeners will get a $50 Amazon gift card when you book a no commitment evaluation. Again, the promotion only for locked on listeners and only for homeowners. Visit mysolarnerd.com and select locked on in the how'd you hear about us section. Make the switch to solar on your terms. Start your research process today by visiting mysolarnerd.com and show locked on some love by letting them know we sent you. Folks, going solar doesn't need to be complicated. And mysolarnerd.com makes it easy. Okay, Aaron. So uh, the theory I want to bounce off of you as it relates to this stuff is I put it this way after the Celtics game that you could start the clock now, but I think it's more fair whenever Cam Johnson gets back because then it'll feel like this team is, is whole. From that point until the trade deadline, it's kind of a of an audition period. I think we're at that point where you're hearing some of the names that James Jones is poking around at. You're you're seeing him, you know, 
first round picks might be on the table. Multiple players might be on the table. There was a weird rumor that Cam Johnson might be a part of what they've been talking about to get a guy like Kyle Kuzma. Um, to me, that says prove that you're still a championship caliber team. Prove that you don't need Chris Paul to be at his best to still be a great team. Or we will start to you know consider what a, a, a different future for this team might look like. Is that an overreaction or is that fair? No, I think he took too long to get to this. <laughs> I think that the Dallas series told us, I've, I said it all summer that the playbook was out now. Like, and I didn't even know Jay Crowder wasn't coming back. It just seemed like the playbook on a team like us was out. I mean, the Bucks kind of did a little bit of the same thing. I mean, not to that extent because they put Drew Holiday on Devin Booker instead of press them with um, press them on Chris Paul the entire time. So I think, that that was like a different variation on what to do with us in a playoff series for seven games. But I just think, and I've said it a lot, <laughs> that if you don't know where a bucket is coming from, other and Aiton has been playing, I mean, he had a rough one against the Celtics, but I think Aiton, he's taken, especially, well, he just kind of owns Valentinus at this point, but I think he kind of takes some of these matchups personally now, and he's like kind of going after it a lot more than he did before. And you can see the consistency starting up. But I still don't think, like, is, can we still expect the fouls for Aiden or in the buckets? And he still kind of reverts back to the old stuff. I just think that James Jones should have known where this was heading from the start. Like, he's seen basketball. He sees how people were playing us. I just, after the Crowder thing, I don't know how many pieces we need to fix this. Like, it seems like way more pieces than we can get. Yeah, that I think is is where I'm coming from in terms of if 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 he gets to that point, and maybe you already are, maybe Suns fans already are at that point, then I do think it starts to be a pretty difficult conversation because you have to start thinking about trading these core guys in order to upgrade. You don't have enough other stuff to get better without that. And so that's where we got with KD. Even if it's not a player quite of KD's caliber, if you're talking about, you know, Somebody better than Kyle Kuzma, you're pretty quickly getting to an all-star caliber player, right? If you think you yeah. need more than that, and to get an all-star caliber player, you have to trade all-star caliber players or guys who may one day be all-star caliber players or a bunch of really good players who you stack up all together, whatever, and th that's a pretty big turnover. My thing, though, and the more that I think about it, this is where I think my disagreement comes in with Suns fans, and it sounds like maybe we disagree about this a little bit. I think James Jones did acknowledge what the failure was. He came into this season. They have made a concerted effort to play through their young players more. And I don't necessarily think it's wrong when you look at, let's say, Boston, right? Boston has a team where Jalen Brown, I mean, what is he in year like seven this season? He's putting together the best season of his career. And he is... 26 and I would say people were really down on him after the finals and he's come in and he's answered a lot of those questions and he's having uh, the best season of his career I think Tatum's in year five I want to say um yeah this is year seven for Brown I think that's year five for for Tatum maybe six I don't know how far apart they are and Tatum looks like an MVP candidate I'm not saying that that McHale is as good as those guys he didn't get picked as high he was already older than those guys when he came into the league there's all these reasons to pick it apart but James Jones, I don't think he's dumb. I don't think he watched the finals, watched the playoff series, although I do think the finals, we overstate how much of a Phoenix Suns collapse that was and understate how much the Bucs are just a very good team. The Suns played really well in that series all the way throughout. They did not fall apart. But then in the Dallas series, they did. I think what his read on it was, though, is like, we got to get Mikhail and Ayton at a better level. We have to make Cam a more featured part of our team. He alienated a starter with his commitment to Cam Johnson because he believed in that. So what Suns fans are asking for is not only like realize what the problem is, but burn down the whole team to fix that problem. And that's where I just think it's like, yes, in theory, that would be a great idea. I was all for it when the end result of that was Kevin Durant. But if the end result of that is like, I don't know what's a John Collins or I mean, I not somebody better than that. If the end result is, you know, even like 
old Damian Lillard who can't stay healthy or somebody. I don't know what I'm getting if that's the case. And I don't know if it's worth burning it all down. And it's easy to look in hindsight and say, well, that's what they should have done. But like, I feel like if you are of that opinion, you should be able to tell me what they were going to get that was going to check all these boxes. Cause I, I don't see what that is. I don't, I don't know what that would have been. And we can all talk about it in theory, but what would have been a better position for them to be in right now? You know, if they, yeah. if they did it sooner, I don't know. Nobody's told me that except for KD, which I was on board with. My only thing with the sooner thing was we're not talking about that. Like we had to get our young players to start playing better and to heighten like pretty much everything that they were doing, but we're also racing against the Chris Paul clock. And I think that was the toughest part for James Jones was having his young dudes become not like borderline all-star caliber players and beat the Chris Paul retirement clock. And I think, Yes, for a GM, that's very hard. And I still think that you kind of got to pull the trigger earlier if your window's short. Like, the NBA and all sports are all about the window right now. The Warriors and the Spurs, they did the weird thing where they extended their windows by having, uh, like, an uh, all-time player on a cheap deal <laughs> and willing to, like, pay, pay, cut, uh, pay cuts and stuff like that. But we got our, all, our, um, our Hall of Fame player late, and he was still at the top of his game, but – that clock got started. Like, I'm sorry, James, but the clock got started at some point. And you can tell once Chris Paul started wearing down and the playbook went out on how to play him in the playoffs, then you kind of got to make a move to kind of help that situation. Because you know you're on a clock. You know that your young players have to play better. But you also know that your old player is going to stop playing better at some point. Yeah. No, and I, I think one thing I've come around on being wrong about as time went on is I think I was – I think I was not like fully I didn't fully realize at the end of the Buck series how much of a missed opportunity that was. Like pe- people were despondent and I was kind of like, "Hey, this is an up and coming team, blah blah blah." And then it's like, "Okay, but you really don't get those opportunities <laughs> all the time." You know, you don't you don't go up 2-0 in the final. It's like that sounds so stupid to say, but I do think at the time it was like this was such a fluke to even happen, right? Like we were all so surprised they got there. So to me, it was like, well, hey, like they'll be back. Not maybe not two games up in the finals like that, but like they'll have just as good of a shot as as any other team for for years to come. And that probably wasn't right. Like they needed to win that one. Um, Again, that sounds obvious, but like (laughs) we're two years, we're two years out and it, it, they, they haven't gotten, you know, they last year, they, they didn't get quite as far this year doesn't look like they're going to get quite as far. Um, But I also want people like uh, part of why I'm saying all this is like people also forget people make it seem as if I did not hear a lot of like frustration or uh, like retroactive. We should have done this and that game one against the Pelicans or let's say game two against the Pelicans when book scores like 30 in the first half and it feels like we're going to ride to the finals again. Uh, I did not hear a lot of people saying X, Y, and Z about what should have been done. I know there was, uh, we all talked about it at the trade deadline. We all talked about Gordon and we talked about uh, Barnes and whatever. I'm not, I'm not ignoring that, but there wasn't a lot of the Suns are missing out on their window when we thought they were the favorite to win the championship after the Pelican series. That still was where we thought they were. And so I just feel like people aren't specific enough when they talk about all these missed opportunities. It's like, In theory, sure, but James Jones did see these issues and he decided, well, my plan of action is the guy that was the number 10 overall pick who we just paid, the guy who was the number one overall pick who we just paid, those guys are going to be the dudes who fix this for me. The reality is they aren't doing that. And I don't feel like that gets talked about. It's so easy to talk about these trades that could have, would have, should have happened. And so anyway, I told you I wouldn't ran and here we are. You forced me into it. You just disagreed with me once and that was all it took for me to take the bait. Uh, no, I mean, we talked about, this is where I wanted to close. We talked about a couple weeks ago, how the championship window is basically always going to be open as long as book is here with like decent talent, you know, as long as yeah. this championship core is in place, whether it's these guys actually being here or them being turned into players via trade, whatever the championship open is going to be, uh, window is going to be open. One thing we talked about though, is there's going to be these reset years and i'm starting to look at maybe this year is that and i didn't expect that going in i think that's probably the biggest place that my perspective is maybe changed is like 
I thought this year would you would still get just enough out of Chris Paul. You would still have uh, the trades to make, and you you would be one of the favorites. And you could still experiment. You could still have Mikhail and Aiton get better, but you would be able to be one of those top tier com- contending teams. Also, I'm starting to look at this year as maybe there is some bigger change on the roster. Maybe the experimentation doesn't work well enough to to be there. Maybe they're you know, a four or five seed that we think of as, you know, if they went, if they got to the finals, it, it would be a, a pretty big surprise, but it's not, you know, uh, it's not out of the question they get back there, but it's, it's not very likely. Yeah. I think like, yeah, I think that this team can still probably put a couple games together. Well, we'll probably take like, Oh, maybe they still do got it, but I still think our problems are still going to be our problems. We're still going to be playing what Sam it like, eight minutes a game that he should be playing. We're still going to – like I mean, like, one of our – like, supposedly our backup shooting guard, like, can't get on the floor even when our starting shooting guard is out. Like, I think that is a problem, and that is, like, a, just another hole that a team this good has. Like, I, the experiment failed, but I don't know what the next step into filling some of these holes and these spots that a lot of dudes that probably wouldn't even see the floor on other teams are getting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the fortunate thing is uh, we don't we don't have to end this conversation fully uh, right now, but we do have to end today's episode. We will continue to see if they can get themselves out of this hole. Watch the trade stuff. Uh, I, I do think this adds another level of pressure to James Jones to make the obvious deal that we know he has to and will make sooner than maybe he wants to. You can't just let the team sit there like prey. And I think to bring it full circle, uh, you know, there is something James Jones can do in the short term to make this roster get the respect of the opponent. And so it's just, it's getting to the point where it is sort of neglectful on his part to just say, well, I want 5% better value on this trade or that trade. When your team's losing four straight and and guys are getting hurt and it's getting ugly, you, you, you probably should feel a little more urgency, but that'll wrap us up for today. We'll be back uh, tonight recapping the the Rockets game. I will be there solo for that. We'll have more shows throughout the week. So thank you for listening to Locked on Suns, making it your first listen here on this Tuesday. Hit follow, subscribe, wherever you're listening to podcasts. In the meantime, make Locked on Sports today your second listen to get caught up on everything else going on around the whole world of sports. That show available on all podcast platforms. I will talk to you all tonight.